station is Hoxton. Yeah, I was lived in the same sort of spot for a very long time, not very imaginative. I've been here since 1969 and um, I got very tense really over this period, the Grand Project Olympic period, because I'd lost so much of my memory grounds. It wasn't, it wasn't just that there was all this endless dust and carcinogenic waste being buried and travellers' communities being disrupted, allotment holders thrown out, swimming pools closed, all of that. It was just the mindset that, that a certain kind of London was imploding. It was terrible entropy was creeping over the eastern horizon, so I didn't want to go that way anymore. And I struck off completely at random to walk away. I never really did walk, which was south towards the river. And um, this was accompanied, uh, I soon realised, by the siren song of the new Overground Railway. There was this sort of orgasmic sighing and groaning that was accompanying me all the way. Uh, and I realised quite soon that the, the story really would be to stick with the railway. Because beneath the railway were these arches, which were like a primitive cave system but in a sense connected up a circuit right around London and it was a sleight of hand conjuring trick in the way that what was presented as being a brand new thing was actually a very old thing and where we're standing in Hoxton now for years had just been a gr literal green bridge it was full of London plane trees that had grown up, sycamores it was, a, it was a wilderness bridge that you could just walk between Dalston Junction and Hoxton over this secret way and that was gone and rejigged as a railway, and it needed to be investigated. <laughs> How can they make the, the overground actually? It's as if I think the middle ground has disappeared. When I struck on the overground notion you know, and realised it was rather like my London orbital project with the motorway, but that, that project had taken a year. The London Orbital Project needed a year, it was, it was a slow contemplation of what is London anymore, what's, what's out here, why are these hospitals disappearing, why are we undergoing these huge cultural social changes. This, this was much more of an implant, it was like cosmetic surgery that happened around the centre of the city. And it felt like, uh, in that psychogeographical conceptual sense, that this has got to be done one day, it just felt right to do it in a day. And secondly, I really wanted to do it as a continuation of the project with Andrew Cotting because we'd taken this swan pedalo from Hastings to Hackney in the Olympic site at that moment as a sort of exorcism of all this stuff that was going on. So now that we were into the post-Olympic period, it would make a nice halo around the city if I could persuade Andrew to walk with me over one day. And he, he was up for it. I knew it was quite a long walk because I'd done it in already in three stretches. I, I, I recceed it out and I just went as far as was comfortable and I, I just thought well if we push it we're going to do it and my sense was to do it really over the span of light in a day that you would start very early at dawn and then it would work out nicely that we would be finishing about 10, 11 at night when it was getting dark but of course Andrew didn't arrive at my house till about 10.30 so we were not actually moving till 11 o'clock which put the whole thing a little bit out of kilter so it became a really insane charge once it got dark and it must have been two o'clock in the morning before we arrived back where we started. The interesting thing about walking together it's not now we're, we're face to face it's a sort of it's an interrogation it's a confrontation it's a conversation you know you, you have your own I have mine when you're walking together, your eyes are like headlights, like that. You're not looking at each other, so essentially there are two quite separate monologues. One dominates and then the other dominates and the other drops away. And, and, it's, and it also induces a sort of confession narrative that you find you inevitably go back into stories of the past. And that, that's, that's the process that I, I found after, let's say, two hours of look at that, look at that, look at this, the present drops away and, and the deeper past comes through very nicely in a kind of confessional mode. 
and that gives us structure to writing the books and that's always really why I've used these lengthy walks as a way of writing because it takes you out of the contemporary, out of the present, into elements of the past that you can link up with and then as you fall silent you begin to anticipate the future so the entire thing is there and you come back to the point you started at, you, you go to bed. And Andrew was walking all night, he said, you know, when he, got in, when he finally got into bed, because he was going to head off back down to Hastings. He was too tired, so he, he slept in my house, but his, his, his arms and legs were sort of crawling through the sheets all night long, because it just, you become so robotic by that point, you couldn't stop. Whether it's like London Orbital and Lights Up for the Territory is debatable, because they, they were really, although they were both London books, they were very, very different. I mean, London Orbital, in, in reality, was an imaginative single project. You know, I, I stumbled on it in the same way that I'm talking about this one now, as an exorcism of the Millennium Dome and all of that. I wanted to walk away from it. I came down zero longitude up the Lee Valley as far as possible, hit the M25 motorway and went, yeah, Eureka, this is, this is it. This is obviously the territory and started walking. Then a friend of mine who lived outside London wanted to do it and, and he'd been doing a lot of epic uh, landscape walks and we used to meet on the road you know, once every month and do this walk. So that was very simple as a single project. It's the only book of mine up to now you could describe in a single sentence. You know, these two fools walk around a London motorway. Um, Lights Out was very different because it, it really represented a series of essays and bits and pieces I'd done about London over a period of five or six years. Between writing the book Radon Daughters, which was a huge, unwieldy, insane novel, which I realized was a sort of dead end, I couldn't go any further, and um, coming across to be published by Granter, I then realized that to make the different essays of Lights Out work, I needed to give it a unifying theme which was of a series of expeditions, walking expeditions into London and starting with walking this huge V shape from up in Stoke Newington down to uh, the other side of the river, Woolwich and then up the Lee Valley as ever. Uh, so the two books are very different. I think this this one, London Overground, is really closest in spirit to um, London Orbital, except that it's a, an imploded version. It's it's kind of as if the, all of that is gradually being sucked by gravity into into a black hole, where everything happens much much faster, and then it's gone. And it felt lighter in tone to do because in that first one it was epic. I mean, it was really a question of absorbing huge amounts of history and change and throwing in a lot of landscape and really engaging with what someone like Ballard did out on the fringes. This one was, was a single, single charge. It was a one-off sink or swim and uh, it, it had to be done fast and it had to be written fast because originally it was coming out from a, a small press and they, they folded <laughs> along the way and I, I then made it took it to um, Hamish Hamilton, Penguin, and they were happy to do it, take it on. And so it's sort of slightly, slightly changed, but it still is in a way a small press book masquerading as a mainstream book. London Orbital twins with the book Black Apples of Gower that I've done from Little, Little Toller, because they were both independent projects about single ideas, like uh, accessing memory in South Wales where I'd grown up and finding my way into this cave of origin, the Pavilion Cave, as against can you go around London in a single day and is this a cave system and what does that cave system reveal? So although they look wildly different, they're actually they're very much the same. The main difference now is that the Little Toller book has a far wider range of illustration and image, including colour, whereas uh, London Orbital, although it has a massive amount of imagery in its archive, in the published book there are only little tiny Misty, mysterious photo from uh, anonymous Bosch. Um, I, th I, re I think it's a really good exercise for people to read two books together, uh, as as I'm doing. And, and one thing that's really noticeable is the different rhythm between the two books. Yeah. Um, well, the, the the rhythms of the two books are notably different in in that. Um, Lon London uh, Overground is on a uh, very familiar territory. There's a kind of uh, confidence, a kind of a uh, cockiness in the language. 
it moves fast and it moves fairly easily uh, and I I know how it works whereas uh, with the little toller book it's more like taking a deep breath and and seeing what I know uh, have, have, have I disappeared from this landscape entirely what are the traces of me left in in the way that we mentioned that you you leave memory deposits and traces through a landscape well my memory deposits in this Welsh landscape were very far away and very spread out could I even find them again and I thought what I saw there was that the landscape was all important and my presence in it was negligible and, and the thing was to find a way to disappear whereas in London with o Overground I'm trying to assert myself as a voice among the numerous multiple voices of cacophony of London and these fragments and the size and the noise and all that you know, that's that's where I operate can I operate in this other way so I think that the, the, the sentences are longer, it's a kind of more leisurely unpicking of memory and there are only certain key figures who, who appear in it, the poet Vernon Watkins who was a good friend of Dylan Thomas who I happened to go and see when I was 18 or something, um, the painter Kerry Richards who left these mysterious paintings, um, almost alchemical paintings of the landscape and but who also lived in London though he came from Wales and then the uh, writer, poet, uh, sculptor, performance artist Brian Catling who'd come with me on an initial expedition and had now written this uh, huge novel The Vore which again um, informed this Black Apples book in certain ways in that his memories cooked in the same way that I did but he held them for 40 odd years and then they released in this epic novel which seems to be new but was actually made up with tiny fragments that had been road tested way back in 1972. The, the, the difference between the, the personality in Black Apples and London Overground is that um, coming, coming to London from South Wales originally was about losing personality, it was like achieving the anonymity, the mask that London offers you, is that you're, you are negligible, you're, you're a cockroach in this landscape and you creep about it and that gives you a real freedom because nobody cares what you do, nobody cares what you say. Uh, other people have already made their pictures with this, there's a, there's a massive cultural history. So you, you, you gradually establish yourself in the shadows and that, that feels good, that gives you a lot of freedom. Whereas growing up in a small town in Wales, literally everybody knows you, they know what you do, they know what you say, if you say something it's reported. There's a, there's a terrific sense of your own narrative, not, not being a personal one, but being a tribal one. And I'm sorry, it's, I find it overwhelming, really, in a sense. So to come back to that is to reclaim what I think um, my DNA is, what my real motors are, but they had only worked when they'd been taken into another landscape. And I was very drawn to Welsh mythologies, which were about London being founded by Welsh figures like the, the head of Bran the giant is buried at Tower Hill and so on. Oh, I mean, I loved all that stuff, which fed its way into to the book Lud Heat, which I did, you know, my first book that really found my own voice down in um, Limehouse and Wapping in, in the mid 1970s. And, you know, suddenly claiming things like the Hawksmoor churches into a system of mythology which was not unlike the Welsh system of mythology of the Mabinogion which is a series of stories with many many branches that idea of digression you start to tell one story it becomes another story and the heroic figures that you mythologize and I was trying to to do that with London but you know now it was, it was paying my dues and going back into that site of origin and, and seeing really what the origin was so, so I think there is a, a, a different tone of voice a different approach and it felt very um, new and, and quite a kind of pleasant experience to do because I, there was nothing at stake, you know, whereas London is, is a lot at stake. It seems that you're, whatever you write is part of an argument, part of a discussion and a debate and there's, 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 there's attitude in every single book I and mean, you, you don't get away lightly and the, the, the book I did, Ghost Milk, you know, was a, an unpopular thing really. I mean it came at, at that time when the, we had blanket 
a celebration of the, the Olympic moment and nobody, nobody wanted these, these carping voices so it was really, really not a popular thing. Whereas London Overground is, is falling into a, a period between times when people are beginning to see the costs of some of that stuff and that the promises were just complete bullshit and it's all falling apart. And so in a sense there's, there's more of a sympathy I think to listen to this kind of voice. Cotton reels and scissors and stuff I, is to confirm the fact that this is actually city mills, as if there'd once been a mill here and it had once been in the city. Neither fact is true. Down River really captures the end of that Thatcher period and the, obviously the Thames developments are very symbolic of Thatcher. Um, I, feel, I feel in a way that um, Lights Out Ends, you know, really does sign off on the yeah. that on that Tory era, and obviously London Orbital is a millennial. Yeah. Uh, what was the London or the theme that you discovered with London Overground? Lond London Overground, to me, was was um, a sense of a new kind of London coming into its own with very different series of challenges, as, as if we we'd seen this pr process of really up to the point of Thatcher from the time I first moved into London it was so slow it was like a ghost dance you know I was describing moving into a house in Hackney in the very late 1960s and you still had tin bath the outside lavatory the public bathhouses slipper bars were functioning it was a sort of black and white movie still and it's still like that all the way through that the economic pinch is on things begin to happen then this almost demonic energy of Thatcher appear, appears and she is basically saying that uh, the idea of a, a democracy, a communality of London is over because that lends itself to independent socialist republics like Lambeth and Hackney. These are, these are bad things and we're giving money to poor people and who, who the hell uses public transport? No real people use public transport. Let's strip the whole thing right down. It's kind of an insane voice, but it's also very populist. It strikes a note. It's, it's the tabloid murdoch moment. Gotcha! You know, all that stuff. Smash the miners. It's, it's violent and it's ugly. And it also means that the Ballardian prophecies of what happens downriver, the, the high-rise moment, is now in. And that was exciting because the energies were so dramatic they had to be challenged. So, so the, the Down River project was creating a mythology that had to stand up to the, the potency of, of Thatcher. Then after that there's a kind of arc that falls away through the sort of grey twilight years of, of Major and so on. The same impetus is there but it's, it's buried and it's beginning to slide and then it turns into the Blair thing which seems to be a moment of great rejoicing as if you've thrown off the other. You don't realise you're actually signing up for something that's equally bad and maybe more pernicious in the long run because it's, it's less visible. The, the, the PR is so slick, the pitch is so slick and that lends itself through this era of, of building insane tents and projects and Olympic Games at enormous cost, not doing anything real. Let it, letting all the other stuff, the hospitals, all the schools, let that all slide, goes. You know. so, so London is now this global, corporate, virtual, computer-generated ghost place. And where we are now, if you get up onto this train above us, you see that everybody in this compartment is not looking out of the window as, as if there's no London there, they're actually looking at their hands. They might as well have cyclopean eyes grated into the palms of their hands because that's where they're looking. They're all being sucked into a kind of electronic communication and this sighing circuit is like that. It's like a, it's paying a homage to the idea of London as an absolute totality, as a world city where you can launder money. It's like the spin dryer of capitalism. It's just whirling banknotes around the city in a, in a strange aurea, uh, astonishing. So it's a real moment to, to look at this thing, this kind of spinning of unreal money, this, this city of empty houses owned by offshore investors, Chinese, Russians, whatever. Any, anybody can come here, but there is no here. It's, it's, and I think this is, this is like a very nice little cartoon of what you can do at the start of this new entity. 
because we, we are really looking at a kind of new kind of city and I think this is my my second last book in a sense of of beginning to engage with that territory and see what its markers are and I can see one more that is really going over the border into what's coming next and um, what is coming next oh, I don't know you have to read the next <laughs> I mean you know I don't know the answers before yeah. I start but I kind of know I have an instinct to know where you go to find them that's that's all it is you know with the with down river what it was was just literally to discover the right geography I mean I, I didn't start out to write the book I wrote but I knew that I wanted to go to Tilbury so I end up in Tilbury and I look at this astonishing place which is way beyond third world and there, there are people doing things that nobody knows about they're piling up white goods and all the trash of the city to ship out in containers to Africa there's all kinds of wheeling and dealing going on and yet it's still a a run-down exciting frontier landscape which is now this city of uh, logistics and storage facilities and huge computers and massive docks so none of that was there at that point but I realized you know that Tilbury, Gravesend, um, Woolwich all of those places were, were really the landscape that would tell me the story I didn't impose it and equally with the M25, it's a question of finding the right landscape and the story tells itself. And the landscape for that period was right out there on the edge, this linked up thing that, that linked exactly to the moment that the mobile phone technology comes in for the first time and uh, the financial markets are opened up, uh, the, the GLC is abolished, all of, these, all of these things are happening, ecstasy culture comes in, you can use the phones to set up raves, the, the motorway was the landscape of that era and I felt this overground in a sense gives you a very good marker, a little map, a tiny little map of what's happening now in the way that if you go look through these caves and see these extraordinary thousand pound fish tanks artisan breads and coffees all the way around dance studios you know all that stuff rather than industrial detritus storage lockups Arthur Daly MOT certificates that's gradually being pushed out and in Hackney they're using regeneration money to create um, shopping hubs Burberry outlets Pringles you know, all that as if as if you were the West End it's just completely upside down since this was the part of a, a locality, the most public thing there was, a slipper bath we all went to, swimming pool, gym, laundry, everything, now just waiting on the next uh, major developer. Crossrail is um, this real bother boy stuff, it's kind of it's wrecked through Soho, it's, it's eliminated one of the few green areas where you could sit in the city. It's a kind of brutal thing, but it's so visible that it, it's not that interesting to me to write about. This overground kind of creeps in with a, with a sigh and a groan. It's a tease, it's there, and it, it's also, it's there and it's not there, and it was there before and it's come back, and this bit just connects to that bit. What's interesting about it is that everywhere connects with everywhere, theoretically. Although, in fact, you have to get out at Clapham and change to a different kind of train and the trains don't run at weekends, all that stuff. But nevertheless, it has changed the way people think about London. That London is now a block of flats right on the railway with bicycles on the balcony and a gym underneath and the coffee outlets. That's, that is a kind of new city. And you don't need, the hinterland doesn't really exist. You're not going to go wandering off into Hoxton. You're not, you're not going to explore these these other bits and pieces. You're, you've, got, you've got your map, you've got your territory. It's a virtual territory. In a way, it's like Haggerston and Hoxton where we are now, are these like the most symbolic places of the new London? Uh, well, I think Haggerston, Hoxton, Shored Shoreditch, those are, are the real symbolic frontier posts of, of the new London. And it, it, it started to emerge again, you know, without really being noticed in the 70s. Because when I was working in Truman's Brewery in Brick Lane, the, the brewery is bought by a developer who only wants the land because he can see that this totally, totally run-down piece of London, with, with a good functioning business like that brewery, um, is going to be the way forward. That you, you can pick it up cheap and in a couple of years 
it'll be a booming kind of retro culture and that's it that's where it starts and then Hoxton spreads out to around Old Street roundabout all of these are these are dead territories where, where industrial premises are very cheap to pick up the artists are live, have moved in and they're living there the anti-university of London was there you know down the road so that's what happens and the, the three the three blots Shoreditch, Hoxton, Haggerston all, all gradually form into an entity that pulls the city money up the road and that, that was the first stage in, in, in the new London I think the most visible but I mean almost it's almost had its moment we're moving elsewhere now I mean that's what if I was writing I wouldn't really write about this territory because I think that story's done and dusted straight from your flat dump your bicycle have a good workout get an appetite make yourself a better person with some artisan bread well, sy symbols of the overground circuit were, the, were new build blocks of flats that were unreferenced to the, their own locality and only referenced to the railway so they were part of an idea of uh, that locality doesn't matter anymore it's more the way out so when, the, when they sell the new blocks of flats that are going up, the way they sell them is to tell you how long it takes to get somewhere else. So all the flats are on here, so uh, nine and a half minutes to Liverpool Street Station. Well, why do you have to go to Liverpool Street Station? You know, uh, it, 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 in a sense, subtly, is telling you the destinations you're allowed to reference. And if you have a visual image, it will have the, the gherkin, the shard, you know, the, the, the symbols really of, of this new London, which is a, a, a city of ghosts. There's a, so many of those buildings are just empty. They are just investment silos. Or they're else these strange iceberg buildings where everything is happening beneath the pavement. That's the, that's the huge growing thing of these. Exactly as in the Olympic fence, they put up these fences you can't see behind, behind which someone is converting a space into a designer basement so that it, it, it's invisible to the outside world. It's, it's, it's the lack of permeability between where we are and what's going on behind us is now being brought in as the symbol of London. There's this a lunch, a specific lunch, uh, right alongside Russell Square Tube Station that symbolized for me the, the beginning of a, someone actually paying to publish my books rather than myself which I hadn't got used to but also the end of a particular kind of publishing because in those in those days um, book deals were set up over lunches people would come in with these wonderful ideas for, for books that they would spin over several bottles of wine and the editors were the people with the power and they would say oh, fantastic fantastic sounds great 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 we'll do it we'll do it now, of course, uh, the idea really has to be passed by accountants and reps. Sales reps are the people with, with the power. They, they say, oh no, I can't see myself going around selling that, what's this about? And the editors have gradually shriveled back in the same way that instead of a, an editor having a really nice office filled, filled with books and first editions and portraits, you know, he's now likely to be set, sitting in some huge open plan thing where everybody is listening to your conversation. So I wanted to reference this particular lunch at uh, this Italian restaurant because it was a great celebration for me because Angela Carter had written a big piece about Down River that was going into the London Review of Books on, on the cover. And uh, John Lanchester, who, who worked, like, worked for the LRB, was, was at this lunch. And you know the, there was a sort of a, an optimism about the idea that uh, it's, it's, it carried an importance to have a piece by Angela Carter in the LRB would, would actually culturally launch a book. It would give it a sort of imprimatur that you now you, you couldn't get in any way. And I, I just wanted to sort of uh, do that. But also then underneath it is this sort of dark side is that shortly after this she discovered she's got lung cancer and she, she died and it sort of she seemed to represent the end end of an era of historic live wire journalism and publishing and I think
round about that time publishing started to get nervous and so the sort of rogue books that would have appeared like I guess I came in at the very end of it just couldn't happen now I mean I don't think I could could get started you know there's no way I could unless I had already built up some sort of journalistic reputation you were in Andrew Carter's kitchen time books and there's this wonderful encounter and when I read Black Apples there's you as a teenager going to visit Vernon yeah. Watkins yeah. was that the beginning of something that became a familiar pattern for you or seeking out well I think I think so this idea of Seeking, seeking out the wisdom and, and making contact and going to visit people and battening onto them, uh, I suppose, began very early. You know, literally when I was a schoolboy in Vernon Watkins's case, because I was trying to write this piece about Dylan Thomas and he'd known him, and I, you know, knew somebody who knew him, and he was he was just so generous a person. This is this is what I realised that that also he it wasn't just me seeking stuff out of him that I would use in this piece, but he actually turned it into a proper conversation. Like, what do you really want? You know, here you are, you've come to see me, um, do, you, do you want to write? What are you going to write? Uh, where are you going? If you go to Dublin, I went to Dublin, I visited W.B. Yeats, and he's being generous to me by saying how he had landed on Yeats, so it's not such a bad thing to come and visit him. You know, and, and we, had a, we had a really good conversation. And that, in a sense, set me up for years thinking about what he'd said and, and, and how pleasant he'd been so that I, I feel now myself, you know, when I get strange requests of people who want to talk about things, I'm, if, if I humanly can, I certainly say, you know, come round, let, let's talk about it because I think that is the chain of how it works. Um, and going to see Angela Carter was, it wasn't quite the same because I'd, I'd, you know, I'd been, been writing for a while and I, I knew, knew her work. I mean, it wasn't, I'm not saying you know, we're kind of a meeting of equals, but it wasn't like going to see somebody who was a, of a totally different generation who'd, who'd done it and who had this link to Dylan Thomas, who was already such a mythologized figure. But it was, you know, again, with Angela Carter, this, the shock to me was that here is this writer I think is so good and who I, as a book dealer I know people collect avidly and yet she's got the publishers have sent back reams of her own books they're just sitting there upstairs shelves of these books so I realized then that there's a, such a difference between the way that uh, collectors and, and antiquarians look at look at an author and their books and the way the publishing industry does the publishing industry you know you, you've sold only X numbers of books junk them so there they were, sitting there, and I, I carried away a sack full and took them out to the book fair and was selling them like hotcakes. But the publishers just don't ever make that connection. They never work in that way, you know. I, I've always sort of thought, even doing new books, that you you have to get out there. You have to you have to be a huckster in a sense. You you're still like you're, it's a market store. You, you've got to persuade people to buy the books. You've got to go under railway arches and talk to people while they drink and tell them what this is about. It's not enough anymore just to simply write the book and hand it in and hope for the best because the best isn't going to happen. You describe the Gower as having this kind of proud otherness mm. and, and it also links with your, there's things in there about your childhood. I don't, I don't know if you have written about before about going to public school and prep school. No, and not really, no. So uh, is it too crass to say you have a kind of otherness that you got from that? Yeah, that I mean, our, our, our thing thing is, and, and, and the Gower book makes it clear to a certain point, is that all of the, all the writing is, is uh, performance. You know, it's not, this is not me. I've, I've created, a, tried to create a persona about this person who writes and moves about through London. But in a sense, you could, you, I mean, anybody else could come up with a completely different version. They'd be free to invent this. And it's an invention, it's not an absolute reality. Uh, and more and more of late, then the books have become these slightly mythologized versions of something that's between fact and fiction. Lots of stuff in the American smoke. Um, I just shifted around and, and treated like pure fiction based on, on real elements. Uh, the characters in Hackney Rose Red Empire are often people I've made up, but based on reality, or, or people who don't want to be represented by the interviews they gave. So the Welsh persona I'm trying to go to here is, is actually more like 
the real version and there's, there are more facts given and elements that have not been given in other books but equally that is just as much of a performance but it's an, it's an undercooked performance I'm trying to create something else that sounds truer but actually in reality is no truer it's just there's been less of it there's a bit in the book we talk about when you were at prep school exploring the area around Nottage and yeah. being drawn actually not to the yeah, beaches. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, obviously, when I, when I talk in Black Apple, kind of like there were the walks through the sand hills we were doing when I was a school kid at uh, seven, eight, nine, and we were sort of supposed to be making these natural history walks and looking for certain plants and blah, blah. And I was always drawn to the concrete bunker that was left there and the, the funny bits of metal that was something that you didn't know what they were. And there were things that looked like bits out of old Mexican sets in Western movies. And that was the, the other landscape that really drew me within, within what was the, the wrecked pastoral of the, the South Wales coal field that had been dominated by coal mines, tin mines and all kinds of strange uh, subsidiary parasitical things and, and that was what I liked because I think because there were traces of the human in it and, and uh, the natural history business was so slow it takes years for tadpoles you know. so uh, okay it was there and I, I liked walking through it but I was always always looking for the other thing I mean I think in mentioning that in the, in the book now there's a slightly retrospective nudging sense that uh, you see this is where it came from I mean I'm nudging you to think that and ask that question but it is also I think very true